All right, Ellie. Um, it's not a stupid question. It's actually a, um, a, a very good one and a commonly misunderstood one. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to catch up. I know your question you asked at the beginning of October. So, um, you know, I appreciate your patience. So your daughter's in sixth grade, uh, functioning well below that. And the district has agreed to pay for an independent educational evaluation. Your question is, because a specialist was contracted by the district, will the specialist side with, with, side with the bias from the school district or will be neutral and give an accurate report? Good question. What is an independent educational evaluation? Um, there's two types, okay, to be independent. One is paid for by the parent out of pocket. That would be an independent educational evaluation because you're paying for it. Uh, you get to choose the provider or the evaluator. And as a valuable member of the IEP team, you can present those results to be considered in good faith by the IEP team, okay? That would be considered an independent evaluation as well. Uh, then the second one would be um, a an educational evaluation paid for by the school district, okay? But with a professional of your choosing as well. All right. The only the only thing is that the school district can limit you to their agency criteria, but their agency criteria has to be extremely limited and ambiguous and vague for a specific reason. Meaning that, um, you know, they can't tell you who you who you can't use as long as that person, uh, let's say, is licensed within the state uh, where you are, um, charges a community rate, which they all do, most do. Uh, and then is within a, a reasonable, you know, parameter, um, perimeter around, you know, circumference or, or mileage uh, distance from, you know, your district. And, and what I typically see is 100 miles. Now, I have seen it be able to expand outside of that if whoever you're seeking is very specialized in what, what uh, you're trying to determine is something to where, you know, it, there's there's not many of those kind of professionals within uh, a normal radius. OK, so with that being said, that would be an independent um, paid for by the school system. They cannot tell you who you can use and they cannot dictate who you use. So many state departments of education are recommended by the federal government to provide a list of. Well, a, a independent evaluator list is only there for the parents that may not know what, who is out there, um, you know, what OT may be to, to be considered or a speech language pathologist or a neuropsychologist. Um, so a, a list is provided um, only as a reference point for parents that may be completely clueless on who might exist out there. But if you already have people in mind, and if you are have already sought out, or if you've done your back research to know that the, these particular evaluators uh, tend to um, have a more, more school-centric viewpoint, um, look, let me go ahead and tell you right now, I am not an easy person to, well, actually, you know, quite different. I'm actually a very easy person to please when it comes to the independent evaluators that I trust. Now, why is that? Very simple. I, I want somebody who is focused on the child, that is going to give their recommendations per uh, what the child needs. I don't, I don't trust, I don't like uh, professionals out there in the psychological field, SLPs, OTs, uh, behavior analysts, I don't care who they are, but if they are 
open for business to the highest bidder, then I don't want to use them. I don't want to use them because at that point, uh, the reputations out in the schools know that, and that's who they want to sit there and steer parents toward is somebody who's open for business, meaning that whoever the highest bidder is or whoever's paying the, the, the check, that's the viewpoint and the frame in which they, uh, will, will analyze and look at the child, uh, or come up with this nonsense that their recommendations were, were geared toward you know, the educational, uh, perspective of what, you know, the, the team, um, is required to do per FAPE. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to look at the child, provide recommendations, and then allow the IEP team to take those recommendations and then adopt the reasonable recommendations per whatever those requirements are. It's not up to you as a, as a professional to sit there and determine what an educational FAPE is. All right. That, that's the IEP team's job. Your job is to provide an independent perspective of that child and then provide recommendations. And then it's the IEP team. That's their job is to sit there and extract what's reasonable from those recommendations and what can be uh, implemented into the child's IEP and services. So see, I'm not difficult. I'm just asking for a neutral viewpoint. And sometimes that's not going to be anything that, that necessarily falls within what I want. All right. Then I have my short list, but if you're ethical, if you are, if you ride the line to where the child is, is the focus, not the parent and not the school system, because sometimes the parents don't want to hear things either. And as a parent of, of a daughter with autism, um, that, that I've been on her IEP team since he was three, there has been multiple times during the course of my daughter's educational career that, that, um, James has been wrong. You know, that I've been, let's say an enabler for my child, you know, to where, um, I've been scolded by some of the professionals that I trust that, you know, we're not, um, doing her any benefit by, preempting everything that she needs uh, because she's not she's not utilizing her communication skills and you know not working on those deficits and you know I can't argue about that so that's that's the whole point of this exercise is is they cannot limit you on those choices you get to select whoever that professional is they get to pay for it and if you get the right one, instead of being bulldogged or told that you have to choose somebody on their list, then you should be fine. Um, and they need to take that report into good faith consideration. But I would be very, very, very careful in, in that independent evaluation, making sure that it's somebody that, that you know, does... Um, is ethical and, and does view the child as the client um, instead of the institution in order for you to get a real fair and neutral perspective. And if not, then I don't know how far you are in this process, but you know, I, that's where I'd slam the brakes on and uh, go back to the table. Because what you don't want is you don't want a bad report being presented to the IEP team or one that is um, geared toward the school perspective because the school paid for the report. All right. Uh, you know, I wish humans weren't crappy. And just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're not a crappy human being. And just because you have a degree doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're not... That somehow you're you're you know not just as corrupt and uh, pig-headed and ignorant and uh, um, self-interested, you know, just like everyone else, you know. So you gotta you gotta move cautiously in this world, uh, especially in this world today, because we do not have leaders. Uh, 
you know, and it's, it's almost like a, a, a tyrannical anarchy to where everybody's out for themselves. Uh, but everybody wants to tell everybody else what to do. It's insane. Um, it, it's so as an IEP team member and as, as somebody who is really the leader or the head of your child's IEP team as their lead, lead advocate, then I would always be mindful and cautious in who is invited onto that IEP team, either invited by you or invited by them. But if you are getting an independent evaluation paid for by them, make sure it's somebody you select and make sure that, that you've made them run the gauntlet as to their ethics and how they're going to be approaching this so that you get the best results possible for consideration, good faith consideration by your team. Great question.